Hold on a second. Hello out there. This is Andy Revkin. Uh, good day, good evening, good morning, depending on where you are on the planet. Uh, this is Sustain What? The um, frequent, not daily, not weekly broadcast of um, my initiative on communication and sustainability at Columbia University, trying to make information matter. That's what I try to do every day. Um, it's my part of this big puzzle we call the Anthropocene. And we have uh, the, some of the usual suspects today. Uh, Lori Garrett is also uh, scheduled to be here with Bob Bazell. And on screen, you can see uh, my new friends, <laughs> Wendy Wertheimer, uh, longtime uh, National Institutes of Health and World Health Organization uh, consultant and staffer who has focused on, on epidemic risks since the days of AIDS, and John Cohen at Science Magazine out in surf country in Cardiff, California. Um, and Wendy, you're in DC, if I remember correctly. Right. And we're going to do a round of discussion of stories that uh, hit. Uh, these folks and my uh, buttons in one way or the other as great, troubling, or uh, indicative of where we're at with the um, the pandemic journey. Uh, you know, there's these cycles to news. This has got the novelty of being so many things at once. It's an epidemic catastrophe. It's a economic catastrophe. <laughs> and at, at a scale that hasn't accompanied any epidemic that we, in recent history. So it, it makes it a particular tangle for the media to figure out and for the public as well. So I'd say first, just good day to both of you. Um, how are you doing? We'll start with Wendy in Washington, DC. Um, it's It's been a crazy week in Washington. <laughs> um, I think to sum it up for me, it's interesting. Jeffrey Sachs was on this morning on MSNBC and he's, I, I was struggling with how do I put together everything I'm feeling about what's happening? And he called it the, uh, the death of the federal government, um, which, you know, considering when you just go through the list of things that I know we're gonna talk about of, of uh, Rick Bright's testimony and the White House pressuring CDC to lower their numbers and the president saying, eh, testing's overrated, maybe we won't even need a vaccine. Um, and the, the vilification of Tony Fauci, um, all of that is kind of, um, to me, a really depressing state as a former longtime federal employee and a true believer in public service. Um, I think all of that together uh, it sort of puts us in a completely different place to deal with a global pandemic. When you say we, Other there, than you, mean, that, you mean the United <laughs> States in particular? Yes. Well, the world. Yeah. If, they, if the United yeah. States is not leading, then the world's in trouble too. Yeah, my son, um, my, uh, my older son said that to me in, with some really wise words in a WhatsApp message yesterday. He said, you know, we were talking about the state of the world and he's 29 and uh, he was describing the situation and, you know, I was saying, well, he works in the film business. And I said, well, you could move to New Zealand where he works in visual effects, like where, uh, what's his mm -hmm. name? The guy who did the Lord of the Rings as a giant shop that he's worked with. And he said, yeah, but that the death of the United States is a big deal. <laughs> you know, it's not just about thinking personally about the failures and the weaknesses and thinking, well, maybe I can move to New Zealand or, the world will not be the same without the United States that functions. Right. Could you dig in on that a little more, that, Wendy, because you were embedded at NIH and, and then w, and WHO, you know, from the inside when, I don't know if there ever was a situation, even with AIDS, when the leadership was so off base or, you know, how you describe that gap between, like, what's it like to be a, a Tony Fauci? I just, uh, I can't even imagine. And not, not that he's perfect either, you know, you, maybe you could address some of that <laughs> stuff too. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm very biased when it comes to Tony Fauci. Oh, of course. So, um, uh, you know, who I have known for 40 years and love and adore. So um, I, to me, the difference is as a, as a federal employee during, during all the developments of AIDS, we were never told, tamp it down, uh, we don't want to test people because if we test people, the numbers will be high and that will make the president look bad. Uh, I mean, such an inter, uh, the White House through Republican 
through all kinds of Republican administrations too, um, there was never an effort to control NIH and science. We never had to have that level of, of or CDC for that matter. And NIH and CDC had great working relationships through my experience. Um, and now I, I feel like there has been this effort to create tension between the White House and uh, the agencies and between the White House and the media. Um, and at, at, at WHO also, the WHO and NIH and HHS were always, I don't know, John, maybe I'm over romanticizing, but I mean, I worked, I, I worked for Jonathan Mann, who was a great leader in, in health as a human right. Um, and there was not, uh, we never had the department or the US mission trying to constrain us in any way. Um, I almost feel, and you know, call me paranoid, but I almost feel like this effort to hold down what we do, to not, not be stocked up, not have enough tests, not have enough equipment, is almost to, that what the president said yesterday, that you know, if the numbers go, the more you test, the more the numbers go up and that somehow he takes that personally and that an epidemic reflects badly on his political future. I don't know if I answered your question or not. But. So that's the ultimate, uh, ultimate example of the uh, see, no, see no evil, project mm. no evil, um, project no failure. I guess that's a new monkey thing. It's not seeing, <laughs> right? it's, 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 <laughs> it's not allowing that mm. uh, that's a really troubling thing. And by the way, that reminds me of um, some of the um, manifestos that Steve Bannon, who's kind of resurfacing right, exactly. as a figure, he wanted to basically destroy the federal government. So what you were just describing right. uh, in um, in uh, my, my friend, colleague Jeff Sachs's comments was essentially a, the game plan, if not of right. Trump, of those who are kind of you know in the background. Right. There, there's, um, another, there's another strand to all this that I think is fascinating that became more apparent to me this week. We are opening up. We have to open up. We all have the same desire to open up. No one wants to live a life sheltered in place. So regardless of your motivation, we all have the same goal. And the confusing message about when should we open up and how should we open up is at the center of the conflict. And in California, I'm in San Diego, we're opening up more and more. And something happened to me yesterday morning that was really provocative. I went surfing at dawn and I surfers don't like each other anyway. We're selfish, we want waves to ourselves and we kind of keep, we socially distance anyway. And a guy I surfed with for many years paddled right up to me and sat down next to me. And you're not wearing masks surfing. And I was like, what are you doing? <laughs> Get away from me. <laughs> And, and it occurred to me as he did this, and I kept trying to move away from him and he kept paddling, following me. It occurred to me that that's the state we're in right now where some people no longer care in my neighborhood whatsoever about social distancing. And it's a very hard thing to turn the dial to the right place about how much do you allow to happen. And there is no clear answer. And I've said this before, but I think clarity and the desire for clarity is what drives most of the confusion. Because yeah. we can't answer these questions. We don't know, there is no perfect answer. I have a firm conviction that if we opened everything up, things would get worse. Um, but we don't know, and if seasonality is coming into play to some degree, which I think it probably is, you're going to see the virus having more difficulty transmitting as the weather changes in this, in this region of the world. And that will bolster the arguments of people who say, hey, open up everything. There's nothing to worry about. So there's this, there's this gauge that's moving and people want it to be one way or another. And it isn't working like that. It's working slowly like this. Right. And I think that's probably the most complicated um, topic for journalists to explain as well. 
Well, yeah, and I'm going to bring in Bob Bazell, who just popped into the uh, green room. Um, and that, that we did touch on this question before, you know, dealing with uncertainty, and especially online journalism. But I think actually the front page, we were just talking before, John was talking about the transition from print to online. And the front page and the nightly newscast, which was Bob Bazell's domain for decades at NBC, was always to make it passed the filters in the newsroom. The, the, at the times, my, my, my good friend Cornelia Dean, the science editor, used to say, where's the front page thought? And I, it's actually a hashtag. Go on Twitter, or you can see I've written a, a dozen different pieces of media. And, and the front page thought, the pursuit of that, implicitly has to overcome deep uncertainty or, or gloss it over. or And that, that's part of the issue, you know, and it's no wonder that Journalists are just a reflection of the rest of society. We don't. We hate gray. We hate the idea that there's normal uncertainty. That it's deep uncertainty is part of this process. And and how do you write that, or how do you report that on TV? It seems like a really troubling question that no one has, not even you know, not me neither, has really answered well yet. I don't know, uh, Bob. Good morning. Good afternoon. I guess it is. Yeah, I apologize for being that way. That's fine. But what's your thinking? You came in in the middle, but you, I think you probably got the idea here. No, I got the idea. And I think that it's something I've been thinking about a lot. When you go back to the uh, psychological principles of uh, Leon Fessenden and cognitive dissonance, where people are getting two ideas uh, that are contradictory and they have to make up some sort of rationale in their mind for how they're behaving. And sometimes it's just really crazy contradictory ideas from, uh, that are based on politics, but sometimes it's actually experts whom they respect for whatever reason they respect them who are telling them different things. And it just creates an enormous amount of anxiety in a lot of people. So they'll, they'll latch on to something. Sometimes they'll latch on to a weird conspiracy theory. Sometimes they'll latch on to, oh, everything's all right, even though I haven't seen really proof of that. And I think it makes a lot of people very tense, and we're, we're, we're reflecting that. And John's right. That we, this is an experiment. We have no idea what's going to happen in the areas that are opening up now. If they open up and there's no more cases, then Trump's going to say, see, we should open up a lot sooner, and everything's going to go that way. If it starts coming back with a roar or vengeance, like others have said, we're going to have a lot more anger and mistrust in, in the entire country. So I think this is one of the most difficult times right now. The weather's today in New York, it's 80 degrees, it's supposed to be thunderstorm this afternoon, but still that's a very different feeling from the, the very cold spring we've had. So people really want to get out. And what they really want to get out and what they miss is seeing other people. And when you see those that pictures of the bar in Racing, Wisconsin, which we've all seen, say, oh my God, that's contrary to everything that we've uh, been taught to avoid. And there it's happening, but we don't know what's gonna happen there. Nobody knows, we can't. But there is some clarity that's coming out on another front. So that's the clarity of the speed at which the vaccine effort is moving forward. And that came became very apparent this week in a few different realms. And Rick Bright also, uh, with his complaint, helped clarify uh, the history of wanting to move quickly at the top level of the United States government dates back earlier than I knew with a Manhattan project called by Peter Navarro in a memo to the task force in February. So I think we now know with clarity that the vaccine effort has more voices and more of a push to move quickly in creative ways than we've ever seen in the history of vaccines. And whether uh, that's gonna work out to our benefit is unclear. <laughs> but uh, but I, am, I am actually fascinated and heartened by how many minds are coming to the problem with interesting potential shortcuts. Um, and I think that uh, it's likely that there'll be something positive to come of that. But there's also um, the problem that race car drivers have. We all know that if you drive at 200 miles per hour, you're more likely to crash. You're more likely to have an accident. You're more likely to get hurt. And we're moving at such a fast speed that I think it's 
highly likely that there will be something that goes wrong. And right. the anti-vaccine movement already has started to shout loudly about this vaccine that doesn't even exist. Mm -hmm. And one of their main criticisms is that we're, uh, science rushes things forward and they don't test things properly. And Peter Hotez, who's a vaccine developer and uh, thinker in the University of Texas, I quoted him this week saying that he doesn't like the language of Operation Warp Speed because it feeds the vaccine, anti-vaccine movement's fears about rushing and not doing things properly. So there's this new tension that, I, that I'm feeling about the desire to move as quickly as possible. So it's, it's such an interesting landscape. You're describing, you know, significant hope. And uh, as Bob said, that that thirst we all have to get outside and reconnect, that almost visceral need to get connected at, at those bars, you know, there's a primal thing that's not just in libertarians, it's in all of us to be directly connected. We like, we like each other. <laughs> yeah, you know, as you, you were saying on your surfboards. So it's like, and then you have, as you said, the great news of consolidated and expanded brilliant minds thinking actively about new approaches to vaccines. And by the way, I think this this feels like it's also going to lead us toward a new normal for how to deal with urgent uh, challenges facing society in, in the middle of uncertainty. The National Academy of Sciences now has a standing committee. They didn't have that before, I, I think. Maybe they did back in the days of AIDS. Um, where, but what that committee is doing still has to be more dynamic, more real time and more inclusive. So, so that idea of using the brain power that's out there in fields, whether they're entrepreneurial or other to, to get at these things in new ways, maybe that could be somewhat normalized. But in the meantime, we're in the middle of the, we're in the middle of this. So one of the things that, I sent a quote to John from, from this before, but I've been looking at uh, Peter Olszewski's a uh, wonderful book about the development of polio, polio and American story. What was and, the name of the book again? Couldn't quite hear you. Polio and American story. And it's about the development of the salt vaccine, primarily the salt vaccine. But in the, we should remember that in the salt vaccine, there was a lot of deaths from polio uh, in the original tests. And then there was the Cutter Lab incident where uh, a lab that was manufacturing it uh, didn't properly kill the virus so that the, the vaccine gave thousands of kids polio. If that were to happen today, uh, it would probably be the end of all vaccines, not just uh, a vaccine for COVID. And that gets back to John's point about how the times have changed. The expectation is that a vaccine is going to, number one, protect you 100% and be totally safe. And we know just from what Bright said, yeah, that's the perfect, uh, that's the perfect story. But we've never seen a perfect story before, <laughs> and it's, we're we're in for a lot of very anger, a lot of anger. Oh, very good. That's Great. a book that we all could catch up with. I had I had missed that one, and it won a Pulitzer Prize. Yeah, oh. there's, there's also with the Cutter incident. Something that's instructive about it is, it happened right after the vaccine came out to the public at large. And this vaccine was desired greatly by the American public. Mothers had gone door to door, shaking cans, asking for the March of Dimes. The president, FDR, started the March of Dimes. He had polio. The whole country feared this disease. And parents feared greatly for their children. But after the Cutter incident, only 70% of children for the next five years received the vaccine. The vaccine was only 70% effective. But the incidence of polio in the country with a 70% effective vaccine used by 70% of the people plummeted by over 95%. And that's instructive because we don't need a perfect vaccine and we don't need everyone to use it. That's an amazing point. That's uh, talk amongst yourselves while I tweet that. <laughs> okay. So Seriously. I have a question while you tweet that for Wendy. Uh, what, have, what happened to all of these rumors about Zerhuni? Well, we Zerhuni, Zerhuni, Zerhuni. I think somebody told me that and I didn't hear it. The National Public Radio even reported that he was getting that job, and then suddenly it's gone out of the news. Just to be a journalist for a moment, what he's talking about is the former NIH director Zerhuni, who was thought to be first in line to run Operation Warp Speed, the White House's project to get a vaccine in in uh, more rapidly. Go ahead, Wendy. Sorry. <laughs> I. <laughs> And who is at, was Sanofi, right? 
Is there any left NIH to go to? Yeah, he, had been, he had been the director of the NIH under George W. Bush. Right. And he was very supportive, as Wendy and I have talked about this, he was very supportive of PEPFAR. And he was very good. Uh, when he first took over uh, Sanofi, he didn't realize that they had just purchased a company that had an, a huge amount of cholera vaccine, uh, which became very necessary in Haiti right after the earthquake and then the, the outbreak of cholera there. And he was very good about getting it to approved by the WHO and then into Haitians within a matter of days. So he's got a good record, but and uh, I don't know. You know, I don't know what happened with him. He's also a Republican, so he's he would be a good candidate. He certainly not as a former CEO of a pharmaceutical company. This is a guy who could get people to talk to each other, and he understands global health. But they did pick Monsef Salawi, who was head of vaccines at GSK, who's also mm -hmm. highly qualified. It's not well, like no question about it. But I just wonder why why Zerhuni's name was quoted so so much, even reported to have been. Accepted. And how much do we think a journal? Hello, Barry. Hey, our, sorry? Uh, our regular colleague has just joined us, Lori Garrett. I'm sorry, it's been delayed. I No, no, you have a life. <laughs> now I have to figure out how to center me in your screen, but um, okay. I have a brand new webcam and I was having disastrous difficulties. Sorry. <laughs> It's good to see you, Laura Garrett, Pulitzer winner, been covering these issues since uh, the late 70s and um, immersed. MSNBC science contributor. All right. And now, uh, right. And now, what's your title, actually? Science contributor, right? Science contributor. Oh, Fantastic. Bob had asked me a question and I interrupted. Sorry. Well, let, let me just. Uh, Back up a tiny bit for, for Lori's sake. Uh, that was a very interesting uh, look back at the um, polio effort where uh, we were talking about anti-vaxxers and how that's playing large going forward, even as the vaccine effort is accelerating uh, in good ways. Um, and uh, John mentioned that, that you know, the, the, uh, the, this notion that everything has to work perfectly is, is dangerous in this context that the, the polio virus, uh, the polio vaccine was 70% effective given to 70% of Americans and it cut the uh, disease incidence more than 90%. So that the idea that we shouldn't, somehow that stories keep conveying, do, do we have to worry about how we're writing about that? You know, how do you, how do you kind of make that into a piece that people will read? One of the things I would say is we have to be very careful uh, about <laughs> saying that a, a vaccine is just around the corner. It's wonderful that there's this warp, warp speed, if you want to call it, use the administration's term, effort. And there's those amazing, these amazing things like injected RNA and DNA and uh, all the other stuff that was, technology was much farther along than we realized. But yeah, a vaccine doesn't, can work in a few hundred or a thousand people and then show a pretty large set of side effects pretty quickly after that. And there's a big question of where, where are you going to test it? Because yeah, if you, there, there's a article by I thought Luandi in the latest on the, in New Yorker online now about uh, testing people at, in the Harvard hospitals. And healthcare workers aren't getting infected in a, in a large number there. They've done a very good job with, with screening and testing. And, as a result, who is the target population that's highly at risk? Uh, you know, wh where's the equivalent of KwaZulu uh, Natal for testing an HIV vaccine or something like that? Where's the epidemic going to be when the vaccine is ready? So, Laurie, I would love to get your um, in initial thoughts. You know, as Friday is here, which is sort of like an artificial sense of the end of the week. Mm -hmm. Um, you were tweeting and sending us some stories that really got your attention. I wondered if you could summarize your feeling about where the story is. Obviously, there are many stories here, but you know, what's the thing that moved the most or that feels most unnerving to you right now? Oh, well, I think there's a, uh, a strategic plan. I know there's a strategic plan. I mean, I've verified this out of the White House to cast doubt on the validity of all mortality data in the United States so that there will be increasingly uh, doubt sowed in the minds of uh, Trump's base, but beyond the base, that casts aspersions on all 
um, official data from the states saying that there's a high death count. Um, so the intent is to get the American people believing that it's not uh, that much more dangerous than flu. There haven't been that many dead bodies. Um, in the most extreme iteration of it, I was really upset to see that Alex Jones, he of the Newtown Massacre lie, um, is now claiming that uh, the healthcare workers themselves are falsifying data, staging phony deaths, staging phony patients, even to the extent of claiming that there are mannequins in the ICUs to make it look like there's lots of bodies there. Um, we're starting to begin to hear political leaders making oblique references to the possibility that the numbers are overstated. Um, and this is just, a, it's so sickening, it's so horrible. And again, if the CDC were playing its proper role, none of this would even be possible. You wouldn't even have this capacity to convince the American people that there's no reasonable database of, of the death toll. Um, and the other thing that I think is increasingly coming into the conversation, and again, is about trying to skew the data or give interesting interpretations on the epidemiology, is to take what we know to be true, which is that um, a lot of the frontline people that are in the highest risk uh, positions right now getting exposed are in fact people, immigrants and people of color. So that, for example, your delivery guys, your you you know U.S. Postal Service workers, your FedEx, et cetera, um, tend to be black and brown people, and yes. so the wards are not being filled with whites uh, proportional to their representation in the general population. Um, this and similarly, um, people of color are more likely, especially if they have um, marginal employment to have had a long history of inadequate interactions with healthcare system, improper diagnosis for underlying conditions and improper treatment. So they're more vulnerable to dying once they are hospitalized. Um, what worries me is that we're beginning to have conversation we're hearing uh, and conveyed to the media that um, this isn't really a white person problem, you know? Right. It's really them they are at risk, they are getting this disease. And this is step one into stigmatization. We've been here before, those of us who dealt with HIV. Exactly. What happens when you start to change the kind of tone of conversation so that it's about them, not us. And I well, think, you know, we're, we've been having a big us moment in New York a big us moment in certain parts of the country that have been under um, highly uh, uh, effective lockdowns where the population has generally gone along with the program. But the as the us moment yields to whites who can carry automatic weapons into a state capitol building, and we know if they were African American and walked in with those weapons into that state capitol building, none of them would be alive today. Um, I fear that all of this is being taken into a direction of distorting and lying about the epidemiology so that number one, it's a low death count, it's all been exaggerated, and number two, and besides, they're not us, they're them. And, and people are just making money off it, right? That's the other part of the argument. They're just calling right. these drugs COVID because they want to make money. Right. 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 Well, one of the things I would say it, it, I don't. I dis. I agree. Excuse me. I agree with everything that we just said. But Tony Fauci, uh, for everything else that's been said, and we can say about Tony Fauci, and this, one of the earliest things he said when we started to hear a lot from him about COVID was that the virus will decide. Uh, and I think that that's the case here. We we don't know what's going to happen, and it's going to matter in places like Racine, Wisconsin, if those people crowded into that bar. Uh, either get each other sick or take it home and get grandma sick and then they start to know, it, know people. And uh, HIV changed a lot when a lot of people realized they knew gay people and people were infected. Uh, this is, is very profound in New York because almost all of us who live here know people 
who have been infected, uh, and in my family, for example, as I mentioned. And the so if if it does if the virus takes us to a place where a lot of people start to see their friends get sick or their grandmas or parents get sick, then it, they'll change their, their outlook. If it doesn't happen, yeah, you're right. There is a great danger of that. But it, from everything we know about the infectiousness of this virus, it's really a, a bad bug. Bob, I want to build on something you just said that's important. And it has to, it's a lesson from HIV. The HIV denialism movement was huge. And it spread around the world just like the virus. And it went away. So an anti-science movement disappeared. Why did it disappear? It didn't disappear because people saw people getting sick. It disappeared because good drugs became available. And as people accessed those drugs, it stopped all discussion about whether this was real or not because people on their deathbeds came back to life. And South Africa had an anti-HIV movement in the early 2000s, remember? You know, and it went away when those drugs, which were developed in 1996, became accessible in South Africa in 2002, 2003. And it stopped, 100% stopped. And I think, I fear that it's not going to be enough for people to simply see the disease. They're going to need to see a treatment that specifically targets it and works. And that will stop it. But until then, I worry, Bob, that it's overly optimistic to think that seeing disease is going to stop it. So I want to, uh, before we go on, I want to introduce uh, our special guest today, Ivan Orensky, who I've known, I guess, more than a decade, who uh, did something incredibly innovative. How Actually, Ivan, how old is Retraction Watch? Uh, just 10 years. It'll be 10 that's, years in that's August. That's what I thought. So. Well, happy birthday uh, to come. Thank you. My son, will be, my, my son will be 30 and then you'll be 10, your initiative will be 10. And you have a background uh -huh. in medicine, correct? Uh, correct, yeah, I went to medical school, I finished medical school, finished an internship um, up at Yale in uh, psychiatry, uh, and then became a full-time journalist, which is kind of where I was heading, I think even, uh, I would argue, in, in high school, but certainly in, in college as well. So. Um, I've been a full-time journalist now for a little more than 20 years. And what what led you to the idea, the need for Retraction Watch? What led me to it was really my co-founder, Adam Marcus. Um, Adam and I, at different points, we've sort of written for different audiences, but by and large, we're trade medical journalists. That's what we do. Um, trade science journalists, you could argue. In other words, for a professional audience. I um, am the vice president of editorial at Medscape right now, for example, that's obviously geared toward uh, doctors, nurses, other healthcare professionals. And I bring that up because Adam had broken a big story uh, about a guy named uh, Scott Rubin, who was a pain researcher, anesthesiologist, who was studying, you may recall the drug uh, Celebrex, which is still on the market. It's got a black box warning. And I'll give this sort of hopefully fairly simple version, but um, there are lots of details, of course. Uh, this was a drug that, you know, was supposed to be sort of safer than a lot of other painkillers like uh, NSAIDs, you know, ibuprofen, that, that sort of drug. Uh, it turned out not to be, but uh, more to the point, Ruben was doing a lot of work that was actually pretty highly regarded. The only problem was he was actually making up all the patients in his trials. So, you know, you, you, you see like the end of, you know, the end of Hollywood movies sometimes it tells you that they worked with the Humane Society or someone like that to say, oh, well, you know, no, no animals were harmed in the making of this movie. I guess you could say that no, no patients were harmed in the making of these <laughs> trials, but obviously that's not a good thing. And so he, he went to federal prison actually for charges related, which is unusual, but related to misconduct, uh, had 25 retractions over time. Adam broke that story and it made me think there were all these retractions had in plain sight. This is a process that actually, when it works well, science should be very proud of. It's just that most of the time it doesn't work well. People fight tooth and nail against retraction. So we think that that's a real issue in terms of transparency and how whether or not science self-corrects and whether it does that well. Uh, and so we, we launched a blog and really didn't, to be perfectly honest, did not know that it would turn into anything other than a couple guys with a blog. Uh, and that's in large part because we didn't know just how many retractions there were. We thought there were a few dozen a year. Uh, 
the year we launched, there were about 100. Now, there are about 1,500 per year. Uh, what you've pulled up here is just our list, running list of, of various things. In this particular time, obviously, we're looking at COVID-19, looking at some of the research around that. And this is just a running list of papers that have been uh, either retracted or temporarily retracted for some reason, uh, and also had something called an expression of concern, which is sort of like a, you know, it's not exactly a pre-retraction because it could, could turn into sort of not being retracted, but it's sort of a, a significant step that journals take. Uh, in order to let authors, know, let readers know that there's a problem with paper to be aware of. Um, right. So we have a bunch of posts, you know, here that we link to the, we link to the retractions, we link to our coverage, we link, you know, for those retractions. But um, one of the questions we get is, you know, oh, is this a big number? You know, and, you know, right now it's, you know, depending how you count it, there's basically eight retractions. Um, that, we don't know if that's a big number or not. I mean, you don't really know anything for a while. Leading indicator, um, uh, just like anything else, um, or trailing indicator, I think it's probably more accurate. Uh, the, the point is that off, usually retractions take an average of three years. So if we're seeing retractions of COVID research already, that's obviously much quicker than three years. I mean, even if you say they started the paper and the research the minute we learned about all of this, say in December, uh, that's obviously still a pretty accelerated rate. And most of these papers, by the way, were, you know, they didn't start the research until March. Right. And then right. they somehow published it within a day. They, it went through peer review, this sort of process that's supposed to be careful and rigid, uh, rigid, uh, have rigor and sort of be very, uh, you know, really letting other researchers, other peers kick the tires on things. Somehow we're supposed to believe that that happens just well if everything's rushed, which right. I happen to have some opinions on. But uh, anyway, so that's a lot of what we're seeing here, and that's where, uh, in terms of retractions, what you're looking at uh, for uh, COVID, COVID-19. And then, of course, uh, you, you've done several pieces, one for Wired, and then most recently, this one for the Columbia Journalism Review, on uh, how this feeds into a news environment that's so, re so needing of the new, right? And so you have research that's rapid and rough and hasn't been through that rigor, even of the peer review papers that you were previously just documenting retractions for. And you have a media appetite for the new, and you have a instanet, which means that you need a refreshed front page constantly. And that leads to, that's a recipe that I find uh, incredibly dangerous uh, because that, the public ends up, with, I wrote this first in the New York Times in the context of climate change, a whiplash effect. So for some, it's just, when you put that on social media, where which is hack, hacking your brains to distract you with the new or the provocative, um, you have you know the press I think has to kind of come up with new ways of dealing with this. Or you really, and it's not like you can just shut it off. And maybe it'd be good for Bob and and uh, John and Lori to weigh in a little bit on that tension of how do you cover this stuff. You know, I think you've seen uh, the previous week, and on Twitter I put up these these flags. They're kind of like literally like a warning label. It says, caution, pre-review publicity. And, and I have several different ones like that. And do we just need to have like warning codes for these things or do we just, because the media are not gonna just not cover it. And then, by the way, I guess you could all say, there's a, the final level is when advocates, you know, anti-vaxxers, pro-vaxxers, when they get a hold of this stuff, then it can, becomes, as Laurie was saying earlier with Alex Jones, it can take some tiny little flicker of something or the president with the hydrochloroquine and, and, and make it into a really consequential Thing. So is there a solvable path here? Maybe Lori, John, Bob, and, and Wendy, you can put them into. Well, I think um, one of, this is part of where you see the difference between people who are science reporters and have a background in science reporting versus uh, those who come to a science story but are perhaps political reporters or some entirely different background and beat because when you're on the science beat, there's certain names that pop up and you go, oh, not this guy again. And certain journals that you say, oh, right, this journal, what a track record these guys have had. Um, and uh, certain themes that we recognize because we know there's an underlying um, crap game going on between rival teams. For example, um, John mentioned the denialist movement and you know peter duesberg was the name 
in the denialist movement as the alleged scientific authority. And many of us already knew of his, shall we say, difficult reputation uh, because he'd been in a Nobel Prize fight to be the guy who first discovered retroviruses. He got beat. And so he decided the rest of his life mission was to prove that retroviruses did no harm. They were meaningless little mm -hmm. genetic elements drifting about. And that required that he prove or claim that HIV was harmless. Um, but if you're not on the beat and you're not following these characters and you don't go immediately to the methods section to figure out how did they come up with this, um, your beat doesn't allow you to have that knowledge base, that background, and perhaps not that time to try and figure out, you know, how did these guys come up with this data? And so I think the problem we're experiencing right now is number one, as Ivan said, we're going at lightning speed. Um, stuff is getting so much is published that none of us can keep track of it all. And number two, we have the vast majority of people covering it all are not, uh, science reporters or people with science backgrounds or medical backgrounds or clinical backgrounds or any of the above. And then finally, there, there is a cast of characters of scientists that have grudges. They have access to grind. They've been playing games in the background for a long time. COVID comes along and it's another layer on top. And if you don't know who these characters are and you don't know what their biases are, it can, it can be easily deceived. And I think that definitely happened with hydroxychloroquine. Yeah, you know, one of the most valuable things that Ivan has done is, um, this is my kid calling me from downstairs. That's how we live in the COVID world. <laughs> um, what, what Ivan has done with Retraction Watch is clued the whole world into characters who aren't trustworthy. Because Ivan again and again and his team have highlighted people who repeatedly, repeatedly make things up. It, it, right, I mean, it's not like these are one-offs, you know, again, and we again, have a, we have a leaderboard, you know, a leaderboard. Oh, and, and I, I recommend everyone look at retraction watch because not only does it help clue you in to charlatans, it's hugely entertaining and it's really well written. Um, I, I read it sometimes just cause I, I want to read something that entertains me, Ivan, really, um, you're right. Your writing pops it's spectacular. And well, that's Adam. That's Adam's John. I, okay, you, you know. can't write. I know, but it, <laughs> it, it's really good, and it's really. And I think there are other resources like what Ivan is doing that, that journalists can tap into to, you know, Snopes sort of things to make sense of someone who's making. Here, here's a simple rubric that I wish every journalist understood as a scientific principle: extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof. It's a very simple idea. And if somebody tells you something extraordinary, ask them for the extraordinary proof, because we don't need to just jump on it because someone said something. Is two, is two macaques enough to convince you there's neutralizing antibodies? <laughs> I would like six, and I'd like a control group. <laughs> Part control of group, John. Uh -huh. You're so you're so. 1990s or something. I mean, uh, right. we, we don't do studies with control groups anymore. That, that's just that crazy thought. Yeah, the, before now, the entire nation has heard of uh, bio archives and med archives, and so and there is such a desire to say something new. When as bad as this epidemic is, and there's so, so many important stories that need to be told all the time. A lot of the science now is not changing from day to day, yet people are being pressured to write stories every day. And they're not just people who are, um, they're not just uh, the crazies who are doing it. And of course they are in great number, but there's a lot of, every time something pops up, they're going to, people are running to their editors, uh, who's the ones who still have jobs or have access to a publication or media outlet that will take them and say, hey, I've got this, I've got this. It was just on bio archives and it says, you know, two macaques or, or two rats or whatever. Uh, and the, it, it's a very difficult environment to control. Uh, I, Ivan does a wonderful job of it. We're not at that speed anymore. This car is on the racetrack at 100, 200 miles an hour with all the, with all the dangers that you pointed out. 
And Bob makes a really good point that a lot of what's happening now is these new preprint servers that are not peer reviewed, publishing things very quickly. I like it. it. To me, it's like being at a scientific conference where stuff isn't peer reviewed and it's up to the audience to figure out what has validity and what has. The poster session. What's that? Going to the poster session. Going to the poster session, right. And I, I enjoy it. But my job is to figure out probability versus possibility and to filter things. Most journalists who aren't trained in science struggle with that. And, and I think, and I'm going to correct you about one thing, Andy, just to make a small point, not to pick on you. Oh, no, it's no, hydroxychloroquine. People keep saying hydrochloroquine. At the congressional testimony yesterday with Rick Bright, representatives kept referring to hydrochloroquine. And this is a mistake that's become part of our lexicon now. It's hydroxy. It's not hydro. I sometimes call it hydro, and my wife makes fun of me at the dinner table. You just did it, John. So we corrupt <laughs> the language so quickly, yeah. and we move away from truth. Hey, we've had once one president who actually was a physicist, a physic, well, an engineer, and he always said nuclear. That was Jimmy Carter, <laughs> and he was a nuclear physicist. So well, no broader than the New York Times, the nuclear, nuclear also. He still does, I'm sure. <laughs> so it's just a habit, I think. Uh, yeah, this I've written, a, I just was saying the other day, the infodemic is mostly about disinformation. I think the part of it that's gotten the most attention is disinformation and, and propaganda. But it's also about overload of information. It's, it is about this process the media have right now of overproducing. Jeff Schlegelmulch, who's the head of our, the incoming director of our National Center for Disaster Preparedness. I've said this, I think Lori and you guys have heard this already, um, but maybe Ivan hasn't, that uh, one of the key factors here that's troubling is that you get certain people in government or at agencies or like mayors and governors particularly, they're thinking that they need a di giant dump of the latest science. That's the last thing they need. They need, it, they need information that's more analytical more measured, and we all are overdosed on that diet of constant flow. And uh, that I think that's a big part of the infodemic. It's not just about those who are actively dissembling. Uh, and I don't know, it may be a harder well, part I to that, act. I, but I, I mean, I, my sort of take on all this is that it's actually just accelerating uh, or worsening, you know, exacerbating trends that have actually been happening for some time, right? So yes, today, hydroxychloroquine, uh, Correct me there, John, but I think I got it. Um, is you know is great. It's it's a cure. It's a treatment. Whatever. And I'm I'm parroting. I'm obviously not. I don't believe any of those things. Uh, next day it's remdesivir. Next day it's you know uh, who knows what else it could be. Um, it's six feet. It's fifteen feet. You know we had a retraction that we covered about something saying it was fifteen feet uh, that that got taken down. Um, but so that kind of whiplash that you were talking about, Andy, earlier is is very much what we're living through now. But I would argue that it's exactly what we've lived through for, uh, well, at least decade. Right. So um, when you say, you know, every week, we all know that, you know, uh, the first week of the month, chocolate uh, cures diabetes. And then the second week of the month, apparently it, uh, you know, it gives you diabetes. And the third week of the month, uh, it gives you cancer. It does something else. It doesn't actually do any of those things. And I, I, I won't walk through what's wrong with all of that. I think we can all at least, you know, intuitively know what's wrong wrong with and certainly those of us on this uh, on this session understand all that. Um, but it's that sort of single study syndrome. And the, the difference is I, well, I, I like chocolate, red wine and coffee, but don't, don't have any illusions about any of them doing me any good other than making me, well, I feel however I feel. The but the problem is that that stuff is, I don't know if there's much of a public health risk. It, there's a sort of noise risk and, and it's not good. I'm certainly not condoning under that frequent coverage of all that stuff and that whiplash, but it doesn't have the same public health risks and dangers that, you know, the sorts of things we're seeing now do. And so I think, I mean, if I'm being a bit maybe Pollyannish for a second, my hope is that a lot of what is happening now forces us all uh, to think about this whole process and figure out ways to do it better. Um, I'm not necessarily optimistic. I'm not necessarily optimistic in general about lots of about many things, but I'm not necessarily optimistic of, about that. But my hope is that conversations like this and you know writing that all of us are doing 
uh, getting it out there and, and sometimes having to fact check and do that sort of truth squatting, if you will. I, I'm hoping that that forces everyone to think about it. Again, I'm, I don't know that that will happen, but the, the system sort of, we're seeing it all, if you will, on steroids now, but it's really very much just what we've always seen, just worse and faster. You know, if this, you were you were absolutely right. And, and I was thinking as you were speaking, what were the turning points that got us to this mess? And there's two meetings that stand out in my mind. The first took place, I believe it was around maybe 1985, 86, American Heart Association. It was the first year that all the statin data came out about cholesterol. And they presented, I mean, the whole American Heart Association meeting, and it was in Dallas, Texas, of course, was all like statins, statins. And at one point, the president of the American Heart Association got up on the stage and said, we should just put statins in American drinking water. And then no one will ever die of a heart attack again. Well, the stock market soared. And all the drug companies that had any data at all at that particular conference, even really crappy data with 10 patients and no LDL effect, right? They saw their stocks soar. And that began a trend that then I noticed in, frequently at all the heart meetings was that there would always be people that came from investment groups sitting in the audience and they would be in those days calling, going running out in the hallway to use a landline phone to say, okay, buy more of this because they showed some data. Then we had this huge turning point. I believe it was the Berlin meeting, you guys. Help me remember, Wendy. I think it was Berlin. We had this turning point where the big international AIDS conferences had been attended by activists, by physicians, by reporters, by scientists. But not a lot else of the world ever came to these. But the Berlin meeting was huge, and it was a particularly depressing point in where we were with the epidemic because the death counts were soaring uh, and we and nothing was working. All the drugs were failing. And as I recall, everybody was latching on to this one tiny vaccine study with four chimpanzees. John will remember this with delight. He wrote about it extensively. And when I looked, I suddenly realized that there were all these guys sitting in the front row with suits on that didn't look like us, didn't look like the normal AIDS crowd, right? And what were they doing? They were running to place bets on the stock market based on data being presented in real time, no peer review, no second guessing, hadn't even been reported on. And I never thought we would see that. And from then on at AIDS meetings up until Vancouver and the big breakthroughs, um, there were always all these market guys sitting in the audience, getting away with basically using the conference to place their bets on the market with basically unprocessed data. They were banned from the largest AIDS meeting in the United States, Croy, for that very reason. So but Wendy, this Wendy, you haven't said anything in a long time. Yeah, I know. And, and uh, let's zoom a little bit on what to expect next. Um, uh, Ivan, how long do you have, by the way? Uh, I can stick around another five, six minutes, probably. Okay, well, you, maybe, and we'll have spent some time with Wendy, too, going forward. But, um, Please, no. Ivan, if you could look ahead, not just next week, that's too granular, that's too single study assist, <laughs> study syndrome issue. But what's the big theme that you see going forward from your context of tracking the quality of the research and how it relates to the media? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'll just say one one thing, and, and, and maybe this is a little too meta, but I, I sort of, I always have a policy of, uh, I've had a long, a long time, I don't make predictions. Um, I, I talk sometimes about what I might hope for or what uh, I think, you know, would be good if it happened, for example, but maybe that makes me a, a weak thinker, but I, I just, I don't like being wrong. It's maybe it's a hazard of what I do. So um, I just like to sort of stick to that. Um, uh, you know, I, I don't know what the, the, the theme is. I mean, I think the, the what, what's what one thing that has been interesting to me is, and I think this actually was something you were all talking about. I know you have talked about it in the past, but I think you were talking about this as I was joining today or a part of it. Um, it is a really interesting story, you know, in the, in the uh, really interesting op ed. I think it was yesterday in the time um, by, uh, I'm going to mangle his name, but uh, Alec, 
Baju. I don't know if any of you saw that. I apologize to Alex mispronouncing his name and a, and a co-author. They're, they're both Northeastern. Um, they're both journalists, and they they took a look at how you know a particular uh, sort of meme, if you will, and 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 really this was about. Ivan has frozen on us. Yeah, you froze. That's um, yeah. Um, and it's a really nice, you know, TikTok of, of various things that happened. And I guess one of the things I would love to see come out of this, and and maybe we're getting to a point where people are able to start doing this, is can we do that for more of? Can we sort of do, if you will, um, you know, bad bad, uh, you know, sort of metaphor here, but really contact tracing. For the kinds of, of whether they're rumors, you want to call them rumors, memes, misinformation, disinformation. I mean, they're all happening. Can we do that for, you know, this, you know, for that sort of stuff? And obviously, in addition to doing it for ours itself, inspections. Um, because I think that we'll we'll sort of learn something. And uh, you know, whether it's groups like you know NewsGuard who are looking at what's reliable and what's not. My only concern with all that, and the, the sort of flip side of that, maybe I'm talking to the other side of my mouth, is I, I would hate for this to further deepen the uh, the divide we have in terms of media consumption, in terms of who people trust, um, and the fact that you you know exactly what you're going to get if you go to certain news outlets, and and that's well, frankly, it's mostly on the right, but there's a little bit of that uh, on the left as well, and I, and I think that we need to sort of grapple with that because to me the the biggest problem here not that, that's not fair but one of the big problems here has been the politicization politi yeah i can do hydroxychloroquine i'm not sure i can do See, that's because i'm a science you. reporter thank you thank you um has has just taken over the narrative right because now every study is seen in, in a particular right. political framework so i i think that again that's maybe a little bit meta but i i feel like it it's underlying a lot of this, underpinning a lot of the issues we're having. And I'd love to see people an really analyze that. I have an idea. Uh, because I know, I see Retraction Watch on Twitter. You guys are active on Twitter. And people are active on citing you on Twitter. Um, and we also have, uh, who is it that does the Pinocchios? Post, post, Washington Post. Washington Post Pinocchios are active. Um, you know, Jack Dorsey, the CEO of Twitter, has put up a $1 billion COVID fund and is, I think, trying to do the right thing. And it seems to me it would be a, a great idea to propose to him that there be a retraction watch logo and maybe a Pinocchio logo that can be applied to certain twi Twitter streams or um, claims on Twitter in such a way that it would dive automatically direct if you clicked on the icon. So if somebody, for example, is saying hydroxychloroquine cured 80% of all COVID patients, um, that would be a Pinocchio. And if there was a way that, okay, you'll go ahead, you're not gonna censor, but here's a Pinocchio profile, click here and you can see why Twitter is telling you this is a lie or if a paper is pushed and Retraction Watch has already identified that this is bogus science and should be retracted, that logo could appear, that icon could appear on the tweets about it. And then people would know, I just click on this icon and I go to your stories telling us why this is bogus science. There, there actually is quite a bit of uh, activity underway along those lines. There's uh, the Internet Observatory at Stanford. A, I don't have the Internet. It's a little bit slow for me today, or I'd pull up some examples to show you. There, uh, Rene Derestra and others are, they have a way to use um, tools right now to track. They did this just now with that, um, the woman who, the pandemic, how that yeah. pandemic theme emerged. Everybody's and, after her, and that's good. But, but I you, you can trace it back. Uh, time, because the problem is, you know, an academic study that says this is garbage. Well, the public has already moved on. You know, they've already accepted the garbage and moved somewhere else. I'm talking about in real time, showing up in Twitter, showing up on Facebook, et cetera. 
Yeah, it's tough, though. You know, uh, I was talking about this with Jay Rosen in the context of the uh, correcting Trump on moment by moment. And uh, Jay was saying from NYU um, on, on this broadcast, we were saying that uh, Trump's strategy is to, to sort of flood the zone with so much crap, literally, that whether, whether it's a conscious strategy or not, it works, uh, that the media are constantly behind. It's that the lag time that, that Ivan ta talked about, even in Retraction Watch, is there. You're always chasing the... Mm -hmm. The boat and you never catch up and get ahead and you know this gets to the grand challenge of the polarization and these 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 um you know the anti-vaxxers popping up continually uh, through new fixed facebook groups and they're always propagating at a rate that's like viral i mean literally but then we don't have a vaccine for the infodemic and finding ways it'll be like with this issue it's a systemic problem there's no fix um I, it's great that, that that money is that jack has put up that money and I hope he's paying as much attention to the infodemic as he is to the pandemic. That's, that'd be a good Andy, reason. there's a viewer who, who's raised a point that Bill Weiss. Yeah, Phil Weiss. Weiss. Bill Weiss yeah. is a really good journalist. Yeah, and, and I think Phil Weiss is making a good point. I think science has a generosity that gets taken advantage of all the time. And that generosity is what we started this conversation discussing, and that's uncertainty. We don't know for certain, and we're open to ideas, bring me the data show me the best data and I'll change my mind if new data come in that alter what I think. Mm -hmm. And it's easy to prey upon that. And sure. that's, I think, what's at the root of this is people take advantage of that generous type of thinking. It's very different from re religious thinking, which is I believe this and nothing changes my mind about it because I believe it. And it, there's no room for discussion because it's belief. Right. And science isn't a belief. And that's the core problem I see driving people who have anti-scientific ideas. They prey upon that goodness and generosity of a structure of thinking. Although I'll push back one more time. And, and Ivan, I want to say thank you for being on here. Um, and Wendy, you're up next. The problem when an issue like is like this one, where you have the pandemic, epidemic, microbiological questions, and epidemiological questions, and kind of a range over the model that get lists make choices, you put that in the context of the uh, historic economic disruption, which puts it in the realm of decision making based on politics and on social norms and on your. There's no con. No one. There's no single moral code. There is for murder, but that's for everything else. You know, how many hospital beds per thousand people per country for each country is a different answer. It's not like a mechanistic answer. So there is this thing called scientism, where you can't just have the science be that there's no place on the planet where science alone rules even in china especially maybe in china so that's like that's that's why it gets ugly again you know it's science and the same thing with climate over and over again it's just the same challenge thank you. ivan thank, thank, thank you, you andy and thanks everybody really great conversation thanks for having me and thank uh keep up the great work great to see you and we'll they come back thank sometime you. And it looks like Bob is off for just a minute. So, um, so Wendy, yeah, you, uh, we've had you in the, we've been talking about the journalism a lot. <laughs> You've been in that arena. The other side of it, like looking at the full landscape of questions, not just the science and dealt, dealt with different administrations and the international questions too. So what's this, what do you feel when you think about these questions? I, it, the, the other theme to me for the week has been this, false dichotomy between public health and the health of the economy. And I, I kind of feel like the scientists and the science journalists um, are, 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 have become the enemies of the people. Um, I, I read a story about TV reporters who are being harassed by the open the, open the economy yeah. anti-vaxxers um, being threatened. I, I, that to me is something brand new, um, that reporters reporting scientific facts are being harassed online and in person, um, that there are, and that somehow, you know, the, these stories that Tony Fauci, um, who is trying to bring down the economy and he's trying to bring down Trump and that the science so, so I, that, I'm really struggling with that notion that there has to be one or the other. Either you protect the public health or 
you protect the economy of the of the country um, without seeing them being interconnected and that you can't have one without the other but this this uh, there always seems to be there has to be an enemy and now it seems that it's the scientists and the public health um, professionals and officials and the reporters reporting that um, have are, are put in this completely different space than I ever remember happening before. Um, am, am I forgetting something in AIDS where there was, even as you said, the Peter Duesberg, uh, Carrie Mullis, um, AIDS denials. You're right, once we had treatments, they worked. And so, yeah, I guess there really was AIDS. Um, I don't, the other thing that I'm curious how you feel, the, some of the news this week included the Kawasaki syndrome in kids. Um, I don't know if that, we, we got a letter from a viewer, I think you got after our last week, who was talking about how we had become so hardened to suffering. I don't know whether kids and, and risk of, in the kids. And part of why we're afraid to open schools is because kids have this new syndrome will help open people's hearts a little bit. Um, the other thing this week too was our, the four of us um, are very close to Peter Piot. Um, and Peter wrote, he, he gave an interview actually that science printed about just because he's been suffering now for almost two months with COVID and just because you were released from the hospital and no longer in critical condition, there are these long-term effects, neurologic, cardiology, you know, cardio, cardiologic, heart and uh, <laughs> thank you. We're all having trouble with words today. Um, that, that, I mean, do those become our new advocates to the people who are still sick? Um, did they become advocates for, wait a minute, I can't go back to work right now. Um, yes, I'm out of the hospital, but I mean, who, when we start opening up the economy, there he is. Um, so I don't, I don't, all these, I'm just a jumble of all these thoughts, um, but it all comes down to politics, I guess. And I, I can't remember a time when it has been so, someone said that you know that who's on the right because they're wearing red MAGA hats and you know who's on the left because they're wearing masks over their faces. Yeah. And that just seems horrifying to me. And as Laurie has said here before, you know, we were comparing notes on climate versus coronavirus and a pandemic and epidemic reporting. And, you know, tons of climate scientists, especially women, have been harassed and death threats and vile attacks online. Um, uh, not so much face to face on the, those frontline demonstrations, but but it's not then coupled to these true real time life and death kind of outcomes. Your know, climate change is a long, slow building process, and so this is very different in that context too. So maybe can you all react to both of those points that have been made? Who's the advocate here? And and then what do we do about that level of vitriol? And Andrew, I would like to add on to what Wendy said. There is a public aspect of the, to the economic problem because we're talking about, and again, it's mostly brown people and black people who are going to suffer. We're talking about food insecurity and homelessness and enormous amounts of problems that are going to be brought on by the economic impact of this. So it's not as though these things are decoupled. And, it, and it, that's why it is, a. some people have said, it's a false choice. You can't decouple the econ economic consequences and the medical consequences. We're, we're in uh, a very frightening time right now. And, and I, I'll get back to where we started too and say enormous amounts of uncertainty from all quarters. I attended a faculty meeting at Yale yesterday where senior professors were screaming at each other and I don't think I'm talking out of school here, uh, about how to open a building. And these are, <laughs> these are all PhDs and MDs, and they, they know it, but they, everybody has their own ideas. And then you go to people on the street and where are they getting their information? And everybody is very, very nervous. Uh, we, we all long for a 
to go back to work. We all long for an economy that's not going to uh, then end up having our children or other people's children in a 1929 or worse situation. And yet, and we're all afraid of people getting infected at the same time we want to, you know, we, how do you balance that? And, and there is no, as John was talking about science, there is no, if somebody tells you they know, we know they're lying. Yeah. Because well, they don't know. I've been, I've been resurrecting this into my library. Daniel Defoe's famous A Journal of the Plague Year, which of course was about the 1665 Black Death of London. And a couple of lessons are worth reviewing because what happened in London in 1665 with the plague was that the rich fled London. They went wherever they had uh, castles and second homes and so on all over England. Um, and in many cases, of course, they took the plague with them and um, the fleas in their coats and so on and ended up spreading plague all over all over the greater Britain. But um, they abandoned the city and left a, a tiny cadre of the mayor and uh, some of his uh, assistants to try and figure out how to keep food moving, keep the water supply moving, keep the city running. And there came a crucial moment when the death count dropped to about 900 a week instead of thousands a week. Uh, and store owners started to think, ah, this is a good time. I can open my barber shop. I can reopen my store. I can start selling in the pub. <laughs> and boom, massive death tolls. And uh, it, you know, you've got a whole second surge in London. And reading this and reading about how people rationalize the death and suffering of others, as Wendy was saying, how did people live with themselves? with the threat and with the death around them and with the consequences of their own actions. It's just remarkable when you read this and you read other writings from the 1665 plague to see how much it's like what we're going through right now. The willingness to discount, well, you know, he was an old person. So yes, he suffered and died of the plague, but you know, he was an old guy. Well, there's a lot of that kind of subtext going on in conversations about deaths in nursing homes and the death toll among seniors across America. And similarly, uh, there was a lot of talk in the, um, you know, in the plague years about people who were, well, they were just merely a garbage collector, merely a rags dealer. You know, in other words, they weren't important people who died. They were riffraff. Well, there's a lot of that subtext going on right now. I think there's a real challenge for all reporters covering this story, for anyone who's chronicling it, to try and bring humanity. Even if you're just inserting a couple of sentences somewhere in a story that's actually about remdesivir, you know, if you can bring humanity in and shock people into remembering what, what the meaning is of the words they're putting out, right. that we have religious leaders out there saying that bring back the economy is more important than the suffering and death and proper burials and proper crematoria actions is startling and chilling. I think, I think Laura, you bring up a really interesting point in, about history. We don't have a really fundamental grasp of how you reopen from a disease or close down on this scale. And the plague is an interesting example because there's a historical record of the reopening too soon causing a problem. But there's an interesting parallel too, or a lack of a parallel in that what does this disease do? It doesn't look like plague, it has its own unique signature. And we know that many people, maybe 40, 50%, I don't know the number, who become infected have no symptoms. And 80% of people who have symptoms probably are mild. So we're not seeing people falling over in the street we're seeing, maybe in New York you see it, but in California, you don't see anything. You don't see anything. And I think that's part of the challenge, is that it's a slow, it, it doesn't harm people at a high enough level, like Ebola, for example, to cause visible pain and suffering for everyone 
in, in, the, in a small village in the Democratic Republic of Congo, if there is Ebola, you see it right. and you go to funerals or you don't go to funerals because you can't go to funerals. It, it, it's so dramatic. And the drama here in New York is high. I understand that. But where I live, it's not high because I think we're succeeding at mitigating to some degree. But I think that factors in and the, the history is a would lockdown, be a big deal. See it. What's that? If you're on lockdown, you don't see anything because you only see what's, what's on your computer and what's on TV and what you hear on the radio and the occasional phone call with a buddy. So, I mean, I don't think we do see people dying in the streets, but it's also that we're not out on the streets. And this is this weird paradox, you know, just what you're describing, even the, the vividness of those anecdotes uh, still is restricted uh, geographically to places like the New York region, a couple of their hotspots in this country. And uh, that creates in the media this big landscape of like horror, but then people everywhere else are looking out the door and going, WTF. Yeah. And that then generates more doubt, perhaps, in that sense of it's the media. And, and that's why, I, I, actually, on climate, 15 years ago, I wrote a story in the Times on is the country so diverse geographically and so big spread that there is no common way to perceive even climate. You know, Katrina hit New Orleans. It didn't hit the rest of the country. It didn't even create an economic catastrophe for the country. It's a blip, not even a blip on the GDP. So that... Yet, yet, of course, the job loss is creating an absolute impact in almost every place. So it's like, does that then worsen? Is that why Sweden can do it more easily? You know what I mean? Sweden has one climate. It's I, uh, there was a one woman who emailed us after one of our last sessions. And I had, I got, had a Zoom session with her the other day. Hmm. Uh, uh, this woman who was born in Germany, but she's lived in Sweden for 20 years. And she was talking about, and she described us, but she went into greater details about it. How it's almost like the uh, idea of people, uh, native peoples in the uh, Arctic, putting their relatives on, older relatives on ice floors. And that's the way the Swedes are handling this. They are, uh, mm -hmm. they are right. You know, they they are just saying, well, they're, that's it. We're not going to. And this woman is astounded by it. It offends her morally. But she says when she talks to her Swedish friends, it doesn't bother them so much at all. There's starting to be a bit of a backlash and more money for, uh, to help the elderly. But the in their healthcare system, even if you're wealthy, you can't buy additional health care. And the older people are just dying. And they're, they're saying, well, so what? We're getting on with our lives. And it's a really interesting thing to get back to whether we, we will transition to that uh, in the United States and include, as Lauren was talking about, uh, all these stigmatized groups, whether the elderly will become another stigmatized group. Although it's an interesting concept when we have all these people in their 70s running for president of the United States. Uh, how do you define elderly? I don't know. I'm certainly in that group. Well, yeah. you know, you bring up you bring up a good point. There's two ways that the epidemiology is getting distorted. So let's come back to the science writing because the Sweden story, you know, Wall Street loves the Sweden story, and everybody that's eager to get the the economy going is glomming onto the Sweden story. And it is true that in terms of GDP losses, Sweden's in great shape compared to its Scandinavian neighbors. But if you plot deaths per capita, Sweden is worse than the United States right now. Sweden is one of the worst in the entire world. Right, by far. By, by far. And, and the scale is up here. Excuse me, you go up to our, our world in data and do deaths per a million and put in Sweden and the United States, you, you see exactly what works. Yeah, the big gap. Yeah. The, the, other, the other way that data gets distorted is there's a lot of talk now from the Republican Party, in particular Mitch McConnell and so on, saying, you know, we're bringing this epidemic down, America is coming down like this, so it's time to reopen. And to which I say, pull the New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, tri-state area out of your data set. Now show me the curve for America. Oh, right, it's doing this. Well, and that's a really important, because, that, that's so journalistic. Is 75 to 80% of all the cases in the country it, it distorts the data. Well, the tri-state's been on lockdown and they've brought their epidemic down. But you take them out of the equation 
and put in the whole industrial Midwest, the Mississippi Valley, all of those states, and you see a completely different trend. And so I think the, the challenge for anybody covering this is to say, what, what is the proper way to interpret the data through what prism? And if the data is, our GDP is swell here in Sweden, okay, that's one data set and Wall Street loves it. But what if it is our per capita death rate, particularly for people over 60, is off the charts compared to the rest of the world? Well, then we condemn Sweden and their experiment. And similarly here in the United States, we have a president that doesn't want a national uniform strategy or policy of any kind to deal with H this, this COVID catastrophe. Wants every state to take responsibility on their own, but also is pushing open, 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 open. Well, if you distort the data to, to support open by number one saying the death toll is exaggerated by the left, it's way down here. And then number two saying, oh, and while we're at it, you know, the overall trend is down here by not removing the tri-state data, then, you know, you can win your argument. You can, can convince people <laughs> to go out and risk their lives and go to a pub without a mask in downtown Milwaukee. And it's not just distorting the data, it's destroying the people presenting the data, which to me is a really new thing. You know, that, that as you were saying earlier, just trying to undermine the notion of what the numbers mean, what, the, what are the, that the White House doesn't want the death rates to be honest, and how you, how you, assess, how you assess the death rates. Um, that's new. And this, this, you know, that the lock them up people are after Tony, um, and that even just listening to Rand Paul uh, yesterday trying to, whatever day it was, was it yesterday? Um, his questioning too of Rick Wright and questioning, uh, or questioning Tony and, and that telling Tony that he's not the be all. I mean, it's all, it's almost like you don't have to undermine the data because nobody understands the data. Just well, under I mean, undermine the people. I think you could tell it. And that's, that's where I, 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 it's so unusual to me. Andy, I don't think this is unusual in climate science. It's unusual in public health. Or more oh. unusual in public health, right? I mean, there, there were severe attacks on climate science that have been going on for a long time. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Bruce yeah, Hanson yeah. and Michael Mann and these guys would certainly say, oh, yeah, we got personally assaulted and we're still getting personally assaulted. And they've had their share of death threats and all sorts of things uh, attacking them personally. Yeah, but, and the, the it distinction is really I was, kind of a health arena in this way. And the distinction I was drawing is that uh, you know this, the front line here is so much more vivid. Meaning these, like that that scene that um, Wendy was alluding to, that I was going to show actually uh, of the journalist being attacked um, bit verbally. Um, that's there occasionally in climate science. It's usually Twitter or, you know, just look at Catherine Hayhoe and there have actually been studies that show that the women, female scientists have been a, a viciously mm -hmm. attacked far more than, than men in, in that arena. Uh, the one thing I've got to point out is the clock. I have to I have to stop us in about a minute because I have to start the session with a group of journalists. I mean, uh, students at the University of California system mm -hmm. studying mm -hmm. water and sanitation. Can I try to just book in for a second? Yeah. We, 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 I think the us versus them issue has become the central issue. And we yeah. have to keep in mind how these viruses really work. If we don't get rid of this everywhere, we're all vulnerable. Mm -hmm. China now is facing importation as its great crisis of virus. Right. That's all of us. We can't play us versus them here. It doesn't work. And we'll lose if we play us versus them. That's a guarantee. That I know for certain. I know. So the challenge going forward will be for us, those of us who are journalists or communicators, to figure out fresh ways to do some of that clarity seeking that Lori was alluding to there. When you know, with American trends, you know, if you can create that sense of here's what your part of the country is doing, what can you do with data? What can you do with relationships with the experts? What can you do with um, engagement journalism to reach out into new communities that are uh, trying to struggle or dug in on issues? This is a frontier. Last week, we had a session with technologists who created the factual.com, who created a, there's another web portal. Um, I can't remember all of them so far that are trying to give people a sense of um, how to navigate 
uh, with some efficiency and even a little bit of AI assistance, uh, the flow of information. That'll be part of what we're going to talk about going forward. So I, I'm going to have to say thank you all for being here again. Thanks, uh, Ivan Aransky, for stopping by. I've got a session uh, again in a few minutes with on climate justice with a group of uh, young scholars in the University of California system. And then on Sunday, our usual um, song and story swap to kind of discharge from what we, we do during the week here. Uh, next Wednesday, Peter Coleman, who's a colleague of mine at the, who runs the, um, among other things, the uh, Difficult Conversations Laboratory at Columbia University, which is a thing that I think every community on the planet needs uh, to talk about COVID. And Larry Jacobs from uh, University of Washington, uh, University of Minnesota will be on with Peter. He's a great uh, analyst of the political landscape out there and uh, navigating paths forward. Thank you all for being with us. Those online, please tune in again and share this. This will be archived shortly. And uh, I wouldn't be able to do it without the Earth Institute and Columbia University supporting this experiment called the uh, Initiative in Communication and Sustainability. So great to see you all. Stay well. Um, Thanks, everybody. Stay sane. <laughs> Onward and upward. Bye, y'all. Bye.